Act One of the Gondoliers, or The King of Barataria, by W. S. Gilbert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, read by Tom Geller. Louise, read by Larry Wilson. Fiametta, read by Maria de Fatima da Silva. Casilda. Read by Beth Thomas. Gianetta. Read by Lian Yao. Julia. Read by Naomi Madeline. Vittoria. Read by Bavia. Tessa. A Cantadina. Read by T. J. Burns. Antonio. Annibale. And Male Chorus. Read by Aaron White. Francesco and Giorgio. Read by Mark Nelson. Giuseppe Palmieri, read by Thomas Peter. Marco Palmieri, read by Josh Kibbe. Don Alhambra del Bolero, the Grand Inquisitor, read by Alan Mapstone. The Duke of Plaza Toro, a grandee of Spain, read by Todd. The Duchess of Plaza Toro, read by Phone. Act One. Scene, the Piazzetta, Venice, the Ducal Palace on the right. Fiametta, Giulia, Vittoria, and other contadina discovered, each tying a bouquet of roses. List and learn, ye dainty roses, roses white and roses red, why we bind you into posies ere your morning bloom has fled. By a law of maiden's making, accents of a heart that's aching, even though that heart be breaking, should by maiden be unsaid. Though they love with love exceeding, they must seem to be unheeding. Go ye then and do their pleading, roses white and roses red. To there are for whom in duty every maid in Venice sighs, too so peerless in their beauty that they shame the summer skies. We have hearts for them in plenty, they have hearts but all too few. We, alas, are four and twenty. They, alas, are only two. We, alas, alas, are four and twenty. They, alas, alas, are only two. They, alas, are only two, alas. Now ye you know, ye dainty roses, roses white and roses red, why we bind you into posies ere your morning bloom has fled. Roses white and roses red. During this chorus, Antonio, Francesco, Giorgio, and other gondoliers have entered, unobserved by the girls. At first two, then two more, then four, then half a dozen, then the remainder of the chorus. Good morrow, pretty maids. For whom prepare ye these floral tributes extraordinary? For Marco and Giuseppe Palmieri. The pink and flower of all the gondolieri. They're coming here, as we have heard but lately, To choose two brides from us who sit sedately. Do all you maidens love them? Passionately. Passionately. These gondoliers are to be envied greatly. But what of us, who one and all adore you? Have pity on our passion, we implore you. These gentlemen must make their choice before you. In the meantime, we tacitly ignore you. When they have chosen two, that leaves you plenty. Two dozen we and ye are four and twenty. Till then, enjoy your dolce far niente. With pleasure, nobody contradicente. For the merriest fellows are we, tra-la, that ply on the emerald sea, tra-la, with loving and laughing and quipping and quaffing were happy as happy can be tra la with loving and laughing and quipping and quaffing were happy as happy can be tra la with sorrow we've nothing to do tra la and care is a thing to poo poo tra la and jealousy yellow unfortunate fellow we drown in the shimmering blue tra la and jealousy yellow, unfortunate fellow, we drown in the shimmering blue, tra-la. Looking off. 
See, see, at last they come to make their choice. Let us acclaim them with united voice. Marco and Giuseppe appear in gondola at back. Hail, 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 hail gallant gondolieri, benvenuti. benvenuti. Accept our love, our homage and our duty. duty. Benvenuti, benvenuti. Marco and Giuseppe jump ashore. The girls salute them. Buongiorno, Buongiorno signorine. Gondolieri, carissimi, siamo contadini. contadini. Bowing. Servitori umilissimi. Per chi questi fiori, questi fiori bellissimi. Per voi, bei signori, oh, oh eccellentissimi. The girls present their bouquets to Marco and Giuseppe, who are overwhelmed with them and carry them with difficulty. Ocello, ocello. Buongiorno, cavalieri. Siamo gondolieri. Signorina, io t'amo. Contadine, siamo. Signorine. Contadine. Curtsying to Marco and Giuseppe. Cavalieri. Gondolieri, poveri gondolieri. Buongiorno, signorine. We're called gondolieri, but that's, that's a vagary. vagary. It's quite honorary, the trade that we ply. For gallantry noted, since we were short-coated, to beauty devoted are Marco and I. When morning is breaking, our couches forsaking, to greet our awaking with carols we come. At summer day's nooning, when weary lagooning, our mandolins tuning we lazily thrum. When vespers are ringing, to hope ever clinging, with songs of our singing, a vigil we keep. When daylight is fading, in rapt and night shading, with soft serenading, we sing them to sleep. We're called gondolieri, but that's a vagary. It's quite honorary, the trade that we ply. For gallantry noted, since we were short-coated, to beauty devoted are Marco and I. And now, to choose our brides. As all are young and fair, and amiable besides, we really do not care a preference to declare. We really do not care a preference to declare. A bias to disclose would be indelicate. And therefore we propose to let impartial fate select for us a mate. Viva! Viva! A bias to disclose would be indelicate. But how do they propose to let impartial fate select for them a mate? These handkerchiefs upon our eyes be good enough to bind. And to take good care that both of us are absolutely blind. And turn us round, and we, with all convenient dispatch, will undertake to marry any two of you we catch. Viva! Viva! They, they undertake, undertake to, to marry any two of us they catch. The girls prepare to bind their eyes as directed. Are you peeping? Can you see me? Dark I'm keeping, dark and dreamy. Marco slyly lifts bandage. If you are blinded, truly say so. All right-minded players play so. Slyly lifts bandage. Detecting Marco. Conduct shady. They are cheating. Surely they deserve a beating. Replaces bandage. Detecting Giuseppe. This too much is. Maiden's mocking. Conduct such is. Truly shocking. Replaces bandage. You can spy, sir. Shut your eye, sir. You may use it by and by, sir. You can see, sir. Don't tell me, sir. That will do now. Let it be, sir. My papa, he keeps three horses. Black and white and dapple grey, sir. Turn three times, then take your courses. Catch whichever girl you may, sir. My papa, he keeps three horses. Black and white and dapple grey, sir. Turn three times, then take your courses. Catch whichever girl you may, sir. Marco and Giuseppe turn round, as directed, and try to catch the girls. Business of blind man's buff. Eventually Marco catches Ginetta, and Giuseppe catches Tessa. The two girls try to escape, but in vain. The two men pass their hands over the girls' faces to discover their identity. I've at length achieved a capture. This is Tessa. Removes bandage. Rapture! Rapture! Rapture, rapture! Rapture! To me, Gianetta, fate is granted. Removes bandage. Just the very girl I wanted. Just, Just the, the very, very girl, girl he wanted. wanted. 
If you'd rather change. My goodness, this indeed is simple rudeness. I've no preference whatever. Listen to him. Well, I never. Each man kisses each girl. Thank you, gallant gondolieri. In a set and formal measure, it is scarcely necessary to express our pleasure. Each of us to prove a treasure, conjugal and monetary. Gladly we'll devote our leisure, gay and gallant gondolieri. Tra la 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 la. Tra la 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 la. Gay and gallant gondolieri, take us both and hold us tightly. You have luck extraordinary. We might have been unsightly. If we judge your conduct rightly, t'was a choice involuntary. Still we thank you most politely, gay and gallant gondolieri. Tra la 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 la. Tra la 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 la. Tra la 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 la. Thank you, gallant gondolieri. In a set and formal measure, it is scarcely necessary to express our pleasure. Each of us to prove a treasure, gladly will devote our leisure. Gay and gallant gondolieri, tra la 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 la, tra la 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 la. Fate in this has put his finger. Let us bow to fate's decree. Then no longer let us linger. To the altar hurry we. They all dance off two and two, Janetta with Marco, Tessa with Giuseppe. Flourish! A gondola arrives at the Piazzetta steps, from which enter the Duke of Plaza Toro, the Duchess, their daughter Casilda, and their attendant Louise, who carries a drum. All are dressed in pompous but old and faded clothes. Entrance of Duke, Duchess, Casilda, and Louise. From the sunny Spanish shore, the Duke of Plaza Tor. And his grace's duchess, true. And his grace's daughter, too. Nor his grace's own particular drum to Venetia's shores will come. If, if ever, 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 ever they get, get back, back to Spain, Spain they, they will never, 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 never cross, cross the, the sea, sea again. again. At last, we have arrived at our destination. This is the Ducal Palace, and it is here that the Grand Inquisitor resides. As a Castilian Hidalgo of ninety-five quarterings, I regret that I am unable to pay my state visit on a horse. As a Castilian Hidalgo of that description, I should have preferred to ride through the streets of Venice. But owing, I presume, to an unusually wet season, the streets are in such a condition that equestrian exercise is impracticable. No matter. Where is our suite? Coming forward. Your Grace, I am here. Why do you not do yourself the honour to kneel when you address His Grace? My love, it is so small a matter. To Louise. Still, you may as well do it. Louise kneels. The young man seems to entertain but an imperfect appreciation of the respect due from a menial to a Castilian Hidalgo. My child, you are hard upon our sweet. Papa, I've no patience with the presumption of persons in his plebeian position. If he does not appreciate that position, let him be whipped until he does. Let us hope the omission was not intended as a slight. I should be very much hurt if I thought it was. So would he. To Louise. Where are the habadiers who were to have had the honour of meeting us here? that our visit to the Grand Inquisitor might be made in becoming state. Your Grace, the Hobbadiers are mercenary people who stipulated for a trifle on account. How tiresome! Well, let us hope the Grand Inquisitor is a blind gentleman. And the band who were to have had the honour of escorting us? I see no band. Your Grace... The band are sordid persons who require to be paid in advance. That's so like a band. Insuperable difficulties meet me at every turn. But surely they know his grace. Exactly. They know his grace. Well, let us hope that the Grand Inquisitor is a deaf gentleman. A cornetopiston would be something. 
You do not happen to possess the accomplishment of tootling like a cornet a piston? Alas, no, your grace. But I can imitate a farmyard. I don't see how that would help us. I don't see how we could bring it in. It would not help us in the least. We are not a parcel of graziers come to market, dolt. Louise rises. My love, our sweet feelings. To Louise. Be so good as to ring the bell and inform the Grand Inquisitor that His Grace, the Duke of Plaza Toro, Count Matadoro, Baron Picadoro, and Sweet, and Sweet, have arrived at Venice and seek desire demand and demand an audience your grace has but to command i felt sure of it i felt sure of it exit louise into ducal palace and now my love aside to duchess shall we tell her i think so aloud to casilda and now my love Prepare for a magnificent surprise. It is my agreeable duty to reveal to you a secret which should make you the happiest young lady in Venice. A secret? A secret which, for state reasons, it has been necessary to preserve for twenty years. When you were a prattling babe of six months old, you were married by proxy to no less a personage than the infant son and heir of his majesty, the immeasurably wealthy king of Barataria. Married to the infant son of the king of Barataria? Was I consulted? Duke shakes his head. Then it was a most unpardonable liberty. Consider his extreme youth and forgive us. Shortly after the ceremony, that misguided monarch abandoned the creed of his forefathers and became a Wesleyan Methodist of the most bigoted and persecuting type. The Grand Inquisitor, determined that the innovation should not be perpetuated in Barataria, caused your smiling and unconscious husband to be stolen and conveyed to Venice. A fortnight since, the Methodist monarch and all his Wesleyan court were killed in an insurrection, and we are here to ascertain the whereabouts of your husband and to hail you, our daughter, as Her Majesty, the reigning queen of Barataria. Kneels. During this speech, Louise re-enters. Your Majesty. Kneels. Drum roll. It is at such moments as these that one feels how necessary it is to travel with a full band. I, the queen of Barataria, but I've nothing to wear. We are practically penniless. That point has not escaped me. Although I am unhappily in straitened circumstances at present, my social influence is something enormous. And a company, to be called the Duke of Plaza Toro, Limited, is in course of formation to work me. An influential directorate has been secured, and I shall myself join the board after allotment. To understand that the Queen of Barataria may be called upon at any time to witness her honoured sire in process of liquidation? The speculation is not exempt from that drawback. If your father should stop, it will, of course, be necessary to wind him up. But it's so undignified! It's so degrading! A grandee of Spain turned into a public company! Such a thing was never heard of. My child, the Duke of Plaza Toro does not follow fashions. He leads them. He always leads everybody. When he was in the army, he led his regiment. He occasionally led them into action. He invariably led them out of it. In enterprise of martial kind, when there was any fighting, he led his regiment from behind. He found it less exciting. But when away his regiment ran, his place was at the fore. Oh, that celebrated, cultivated, underrated nobleman, the Duke of Plaza Toro. In the first and foremost flight, ha-ha, you always found that knight, ha-ha, 
that celebrated, cultivated, underrated nobleman, the Duke of Plaza Toro. In the first and foremost flight, ha ha, you always found that night, ha ha, that celebrated, cultivated, underrated nobleman, the Duke of Plaza Toro. When, to evade destruction's hand, to hide they all proceeded, no soldier in that gallant band hid half as well as he did. He lay concealed throughout the war, and so preserved his gore, oh, that unaffected, undetected, well-connected warrior, the Duke of Plaza Toro. In every doughty deed, ha ha, he always took the lead, ha ha, that unaffected, undetected, well-connected warrior, the Duke of Plaza Toro. When told that they would all be shot, unless they left the service, that hero hesitated not, so marvellous his nerve is. He sent his resignation in, the first of all his corps, oh, that very knowing, overflowing, easy-going paladin, the Duke of Plaza Toro. To men of grosser clay, ha-ha, he always showed the way, ha-ha, that very knowing, overflowing, easy-going paladin, the Duke of Plaza Toro. Exeunt Duke and Duchess into Grand Ducal Palace. As soon as they have disappeared, Louise and Casilda rush to each other's arms. O rapture when alone together, two loving hearts and those that bear them, may join in temporary tether, though fate apart should rudely tear them. Necessity, invention's mother, compelled me to a course of feigning. But left alone with one another, I will atone for my disdaining. Ah, well, beloved, mine angry frown is but a gown that serves to dress my gentleness. Ah, well, beloved, thy cold disdain, it gives no pain, tis mercy played in masquerade. Ah, well, beloved, mine angry frown is but a gown that serves to dress my gentleness. Ah, well, beloved, thy cold disdain, it gives no pain, tis mercy played in masquerade. Oh, Louis, Louis, what have you said? What have I done? What have I allowed you to do? Nothing, I trust, that you will ever have reason to repent. Offering to embrace her. Withdrawing from him. Nay, Louis, it may not be. I have embraced you for the last time. Casilda. I have just learnt, to my surprise and indignation, that I was wed in babyhood to the infant son of the king of Barataria. The son of the king of Barataria? The child who was stolen in infancy by the Inquisition? The same, but of course you know his story. Know his story? Why, I have often told you that my mother was the nurse to whose charge he was entrusted. True, I had forgotten. Well, he has been discovered, and my father has brought me here to claim his hand. But you will not recognize this marriage? It took place when you were too young to understand its import. Nay, Louis, respect my principles, and cease to torture me with vain entreaties. Henceforth, my life is another's. But stay, the present and the future, they are another's. But the past... That at least is ours, and none can take it from us. As we may revel in naught else, let us revel in that. I don't think I grasp your meaning. Yet that is logical enough. You say you cease to love me? I say I may not love you. Ah, but you do not say you did not love me. I loved you with a frenzy that words are powerless to express, and that but a brief ten minutes since. Exactly. My own, that is, until ten minutes since my own. My lately loved, my recently adored. Ah, tell me that until, say, a quarter of an hour ago, I was still all in all to thee. Embracing her. I see your idea. It's ingenious, but... Don't do that. Releasing herself. There can be no harm in reveling in the past. None whatever, but an embrace cannot be taken to act retrospectively. Perhaps not. 
we may recollect an embrace. I recollect many, but we must not repeat them. Ah, uh, then let us recollect a few. A moment's pause as they recollect, then both heave a deep sigh. Ah, Casilda, you were to me as the sun is to the earth. A quarter of an hour ago? About that. And to think that, but for this miserable discovery, you would have been my own for life. Through life to death a quarter of an hour ago. How greedily my thirsty ears would have drunk the golden melody of those sweet words a quarter. Well, it's now about twenty minutes since. Looking at her watch. About that. In such a matter one cannot be too precise. And now our love, so full of life, is but a silent, solemn memory. Must it be so, Casilda? Louis, it must be so. There was a time, a time forever gone. Ah, woe is me. It was no crime to love but thee alone. Ah, woe is me. One heart, one life, one soul, one aim, one goal, each in the other's thrall. Each all in all, ah, woe is me. O oh, bury, bury, let the grave close o'er the days that were, that never will be more. O oh, bury, bury love that all condemn, and let the whirlwind mourn its requiem. Dead as the last year's leaves, as gathered flowers, ah, woe is me. Dead as the garnered sheaves, that love of ours, ah, woe is me. Born but to fade and die when hope was high, Dead and as far away as yesterday. Ah, woe is me. O oh, bury, bury, let the grave close o'er The days that were, that never will be more. O oh, bury, bury love that all condemn, And let the whirlwind mourn its requiem. Re-enter from the Ducal Palace the Duke and Duchess, followed by Don Alhambro del Bolero, the Grand Inquisitor. My child, allow me to present to you his distinction, Don Alhambro del Bolero, the Grand Inquisitor of Spain. It was his distinction who so thoughtfully abstracted your infant husband and brought him to Venice. So this is the little lady who is so unexpectedly called upon to assume the functions of royalty. And a very nice little lady, too. Jimp, isn't she? Distinctly Jimp. Allow me. Offers his hand. She turns away scornfully. Naughty temper. You must make some allowance. Her Majesty's head is a little turned by her access of dignity. I could have wished that Her Majesty's access of dignity had turned it in this direction. Unfortunately, if I am not mistaken, there appears to be some little doubt as to His Majesty's whereabouts. A doubt as to his whereabouts? Then we may yet be saved. A doubt? Oh dear, no, no doubt at all. He is here in Venice, plying the modest but picturesque calling of a gondolier. I can give you his address. I see him every day. In the entire annals of our history, there is absolutely no circumstance so entirely free from all manner of doubt of any kind whatever. Listen, and I'll tell you all about it. I stole the prince, and I brought him here, and I left him gaily prattling with a highly respectable gondolier who promised the royal babe to rear and teach him the trade of a timonier with his own beloved prattling. Ah, both the boys were strong and stout, and considering all things clever, of that there is no manner of doubt, no probable possible shadow of doubt, no possible doubt whatever. No possible doubt whatever. 
but owing i'm much disposed to fear to his terrible taste for tippling that highly respectable gondolier could never declare with a mind sincere oh, which of the two was his offspring dear and which the royal stripling which was which he could never make out despite his best endeavour of that there is no manner of doubt no probable possible shadow of doubt no possible doubt whatever no possible doubt whatever time sped and when at the end of a year i sought that infant cherished that highly respectable gondolier was lying a corpse on his humble bier i dropped a grand inquisitor's tear that gondolier had perished a taste for drink combined with gout had doubled him up for ever of that there is no manner of doubt no probable possible shadow of doubt no possible doubt whatever no possible doubt whatever the children followed his old career this statement can't be parried of a highly respectable gondolier while well, one of the two who will soon be here but which of the two it is not quite clear is the royal prince you married search in and out and round about and you'll discover never a tale so free from every doubt or probable possible shadow of doubt or possible doubt whatever a tale so free from every doubt all probable possible shadow of doubt all, all possible, possible doubt, doubt whatever, whatever then do you mean to say that i am married to one of two gondoliers but it is impossible to say which without any doubt of any kind whatever but be reassured the nurse to whom your husband was entrusted is the mother of the musical young man who is such a past master of that delicately modulated instrument indicating the drum she can no doubt establish the king's identity beyond all question heavens how did she know that my young friend a grand inquisitor is always up to date to casilda his mother is at present the wife of a highly respectable and old established brigand who carries on an extensive practice in the mountains around cordova accompanied by two of my emissaries he will set off at once for his mother's address she will return with them and if she finds any difficulty in making up her mind the persuasive influence of the torture chamber will jog her memory but bless my heart consider my position i am the wife of one that's very clear but who can tell except by intuition which is the prince and which the gondolier submit to fate without unseemly wrangle such complications frequently occur life is one closely complicated tangle death is the only true unraveller try we life long we can never straighten out life's tangled skein why should we in vain endeavour guess and guess and guess again life's a pudding full of plums care's a canker that benumbs life's a pudding full of plums care's a canker that benumbs wherefore waste our elocution on impossible solution life's a pleasant institution let us take it as it comes set aside the dull enigma we shall guess it all too soon failure brings no kind of stigma dance we to another tune string the lyre and fill the cup lest on sorrow we should sup hop and skip to fancy's fiddle hands across and down the middle life's perhaps the only riddle that we shrink from giving up exeunt all into ducal palace except louise who goes off in gondola enter gondoliers and contadina followed by marco gianetta giuseppe and tessa bridegroom and bride not that insoluble voices all voluble hail it with pride bridegroom and bride we in sincerity wish you prosperity bridegroom and bride when a merry maiden marries 
Sorrow goes and pleasure tarries. Every sound becomes a song. All is right and nothing's wrong. From today and ever after, let our tears be tears of laughter. Every sigh that finds a vent be a sigh of sweet content. When you marry, merry maiden, then the air with love is laden. Every flower is a rose, every goose becomes a swan, every kind of trouble goes where the last year's snows have gone. Sunlight takes the place of shade when you marry, merry maid. When a merry maiden marries, sorrow goes and pleasure tarries. Every sound becomes a song, all is right and nothing's wrong. Gnawing care and aching sorrow, get ye gone until tomorrow. Jealousies in grim array, ye are things of yesterday. When you marry, merry maiden, then the air with joy is laden. All the corners of the earth ring with music sweetly played. Worry is melodious mirth, grief is joy in masquerade. Sullen night is laughing day, all the year is merry May. At the end of the song, Don Alhambra enters at back. The gondoliers and contadina shrink from him and gradually go off, much alarmed. And now our lives are going to begin in real earnest. What's a bachelor? A mere nothing. He's a chrysalis. He can't be said to live. He exists. What a delightful institution marriage is. Why have we wasted all this time? Why didn't we marry ten years ago? Because you couldn't find anybody nice enough. Because you were waiting for us. I suppose that was the reason. We were waiting for you without knowing it. Don Alhambra comes forward. Hello. Good morning. If this gentleman is an undertaker, it's a bad omen. Ceremony of some sort going on? He is an undertaker. No, a little unimportant family gathering. Nothing in your line. Somebody's birthday, I suppose. Yes, mine. And mine. And mine. And mine. Curious coincidence. And how old may you all be? It's a rude question. But about ten minutes. Remarkably fine children. But surely you are jesting. In other words, we were married about ten minutes since. Married? You don't mean to say you are married? Oh, yes, we are married. What, a both of you? All four of us. Bless my heart, how extremely awkward. You don't mind, I suppose? You were not thinking of either of us for yourself, I presume. Oh, Giuseppe, look at him. He was. He's heartbroken. No, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. Now, my man. Slapping him on the back. We don't want anything in your line today. And if your curiosity's satisfied, you can go. You, you mustn't call me your man. It's a liberty. I don't think you know who I am. Not we, indeed. We are jolly gondoliers, the sons of Battisto Palmieri, who led the last revolution. Republicans, heart and soul, we hold all men to be equal. As we abhor oppression, we abhor kings. As we detest vainglory, we detest rank. As we despise effeminacy, we despise wealth. We are Venetian gondoliers, your equals in everything except our calling, and in that at once your masters and your servants. Bless my heart, how unfortunate. One of you may be Baptisto's son, for anything I know to the contrary, but the other is no less a personage than the only son of the late king of Barataria. What? And I trust, I trust it was that one who slapped me on the shoulder and called me his man. One of us a king, not brothers. The king of Barataria? Well, who'd have thought it? But which is it? What does it matter? As you are both republicans, and hold kings in detestation, of course you'll abdicate at once. Good morning. Going. Oh, don't do that. Marco and Giuseppe stop him. Well, as to that, of course there are kings 
and kings. When I say that I detest kings, I mean I detest bad kings. I see. It's a delicate distinction. Quite so. Now I can conceive a kind of king, an ideal king, the creature of my fancy. You know who would be absolutely unobjectionable. A king, for instance, who would abolish taxes and make everything cheap, except gondolas. And give a great many free entertainments to the gondoliers. And let off fireworks on the Grand Canal, and engage all the gondolas for the occasion. And scramble money on the Rialto among the gondoliers. Such a king would be a blessing to his people. And if I were a king, that is the sort of king I would be. And so would I. Come, I'm glad to find your objections are not insuperable. Oh, they're not insuperable. No, they're not insuperable. Besides, we are open to conviction. Yes, they are open to conviction. Oh, they've often been convicted. Our views may have been hastily formed on insufficient grounds. They may be crude, ill-digested, erroneous. I have a very poor opinion of the politician who is not open to conviction. To Gianetta. Oh, he is a fine fellow. Yes, that's the sort of politician for my money. Then we'll consider it settled. Now, as the country is in a state of insurrection, it is absolutely necessary that you should assume the reins of government at once. And until it is ascertained which of you is to be king, I have arranged that you will reign jointly, so that no question can arise hereafter as to the validity of any of your acts. As one individual? As one individual. Linking himself with Marco. Like this? Well, something like that. And we may take our friends with us, and give them places about the court? Undoubtedly. That's always done. I'm convinced. So am I. Then the sooner we're off, the better. We'll just run home and pack up a few things. Stop, stop. That won't do at all. Ladies are not admitted. What? what? Not admitted, not at present. Afterwards, perhaps. We'll see. Why? You don't mean to say you are going to separate us from our wives? Oh, this is very awkward. Only for a time, a few months. After all, what's a few months? But we've only been married half an hour. <gasps> kind sir, you cannot have the heart, our lives to part from those to whom an hour ago we were united. Before our flowing hopes you stem, ah, oh, look at them, and pause before you deal this blow, all uninvited. You men can never understand that heart and hand cannot be separated when we go a-yearning. You see, you've only women's eyes to idolise, and only women's hearts, poor men, to set you burning. Ah, oh, me, you men will never understand that women's heart is one with women's hand. Some kind of charm you seem to find in womankind, some source of unexplained delight, unless you're jesting. But what attracts you, I confess, I cannot guess. To me, a woman's face is quite uninteresting. If from my sister I were torn, it could be born. I should no doubt be horrified, but I could bear it. But Marco is quite another thing. He is my king. He has my heart, and none beside shall ever share it. Ah, oh, me, you men will never understand that women's heart is one with women's hand. Do not give way to this uncalled-for grief. Your separation will be very brief. To ascertain which is the king and which the other, to Barataria's court I'll bring his foster mother. Her former nursling to declare she'll be delighted. That settled. Let each happy pair be reunited. Viva! His argument is strong. Viva! We'll not be parted long. Viva! It will be settled soon. Viva! Then comes our honeymoon. Exit Don Alhambra. Then one of us will be a queen and sit on a golden throne with a crown instead of a hat on her head, and diamonds all her own. With a beautiful robe of gold and green, I've always understood. I wonder whether she'd wear a feather. 
I rather think she should. Oh, tis a glorious thing, I ween, to be a regular royal queen. No half and half affair, I mean, but a right down regular royal queen. She'll drive about in a carriage and pair, with a king on her left hand side, and a milk white horse, as a matter of course, whenever she wants to ride, with beautiful silver shoes to wear upon her dainty feet, with endless stocks of beautiful frocks, and as much as she wants to eat. Oh, tis a glorious thing, I ween, to be a regular royal queen. No half and half affair, I mean, but a right down regular royal queen. Whenever she condescends to walk, be sure she'll shine at that, with her haughty stare and her nose in the air, like a well-born aristocrat. At elegant high society talk, she'll bear away the bell with her howdy-do and her how are you, and I trust I see you well. Oh, tis a glorious thing, I ween, to be a regular royal queen. No half and half affair, I mean, but a right down regular royal queen. Oh, tis a glorious thing, I ween, to be a regular royal queen. No half and half affair, I mean, but a right down regular royal queen. And noble lords will scrape and bow, and double themselves in two, and open their eyes in blank surprise at whatever she likes to do. And everybody will roundly vow she's fair as flowers in May, and say how clever and whatsoever she condescends to say. Oh, tis a glorious thing, I ween, to be a regular royal queen. No half and half affair, I mean, but a right down regular royal queen. Enter chorus of gondoliers and contadine. Now pray, what is the cause of this remarkable hilarity? This sudden ebullition of unmitigated jollity? Has anybody blessed you with a sample of his charity? Or have you been adopted by a gentleman of quality? Replying, we sing, as one individual, as I find I'm a king, to my kingdom I bid you all. I'm aware you object to pavilions and palaces, but you'll find I respect your republican fallacies. As they know we object to pavilions and palaces, how can they respect our republican fallacies? For everyone who feels inclined, some post we undertake to find, congenial with his frame of mind, and all shall equal be. The Chancellor in his peruke, the Earl, the Marquis, and the Duke, the Groom, the Butler, and the Cook, they all shall equal be. The aristocrat who banks with coots, the aristocrat who hunts and shoots, the aristocrat who cleans our boots, they all shall equal be. The noble lord who rules the state, the noble lord who cleans the plate, the noble lord who scrubs the grate, they all shall equal be. The lord high bishop orthodox, the lord high coachman on the box, the lord high vagabond in the stocks, they all shall equal be. For every one who feels inclined, some post we undertake to find, congenial with his frame of mind, and all shall equal be. Sing high, sing low, wherever they go, they all shall equal be. Sing high, sing low, wherever they go, they all shall equal be. The earl, the marquis, and the duke, the groom, the butler, and the cook. The aristocrat who banks with coots, the aristocrat who cleans the boots. S the noble lord who rules the state, the noble lord who scrubs the grate, the lord high bishop orthodox, the lord high vagabond in the stocks. For every one who feels inclined, some post we undertake to find, congenial with his frame of mind, and all shall equal be. Sing high, sing low, wherever they go, they all shall equal be. Then hail, O king, whichever you may be, to you we sing, but do not bend the knee. Then hail, O king. Come, let's away. Our island crown awaits me. Conflicting feelings rend my soul apart. The thought of royal dignity elates me, but leaving thee behind me breaks my heart. Addressing Janetta and Tessa. Farewell, my love. On board you must be getting. But while upon the sea you gaily roam, remember that a heart for thee is fretting, the tender little heart you've left at home. Now, Marco, dear, my wish is here. While you're away, it's understood you will be good, and not too gay. To every trace of maiden grace you will be blind, and will not glance by any chance on womankind. If you are wise, you'll shut your eyes till we arrive, and not address a lady less than forty-five. 
you'll be pleased to frown on every gown that you may see. And, oh, my pet, you won't forget you have married me. And, oh, my darling, oh, my pet, whatever else you may forget, in yonder isle beyond the sea, do not forget you've married me. You lay your head upon your bed at set of sun. You will not sing of anything to any one. You'll sit and mope all day, I hope, and shed a tear upon the life your little wife is passing here. And if so be you think of me, please tell the moon. I'll read it all in rays that fall on the lagoon. You'll be so kind as tell the wind how you may be, and send me words by little birds to comfort me. And oh, my darling, oh, my pet, whatever else you may forget, in yonder isle beyond the sea, do not forget you've married me. And oh, my darling, oh, my pet, whatever else you may forget, in yonder isle beyond the sea, do not forget you've married me. During which a zebek is hauled alongside the quay. Then away we go to an island fair that lies in a southern sea. We know not where, and we don't much care, wherever that isle may be. Hauling on boat. One, two, three, haul! One, two, three, haul! One, two, three, haul! One, two, three, haul! With a will! When the breezes are blowing, the ship will be when going. When they don't, they will when all they don't, stand still. We shall then away we go, away we go to an island fair. We know not where, we don't care. Wherever, wherever, wherever we are. And we don't much care, wherever that isle may be. Away we go to a balmy isle, where the roses blow all the winter while. Where the roses blow all the winter while. Hoisting sail. Then away we go to an island fair that lies in a southern sea. Then away we go to an island fair. Then away, away, then away, away, then then away. away. The men embark on the Zebek, Marco and Giuseppe embracing Janetta and Tessa. The girls wave a farewell to the men as the curtain falls. End of Act One. Act Two of The Gondoliers by W. S. Gilbert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. Scene. Pavilion in the court of Barataria. Marco and Giuseppe, magnificently dressed, are seated on two thrones, occupied in cleaning the crown and the scepter. The gondoliers are discovered, dressed, some as courtiers, officers of rank, etc., and others as private soldiers and servants of various degrees. All are enjoying themselves without reference to social distinctions, some playing cards, others throwing dice, some reading, others playing cup and ball, mora, etc. Of happiness, the very pith in Barataria you may see, a monarchy that's tempered with republican equality. This form of government we find the beau ideal of its kind, a despotism strict combined with absolute equality. Two kings of undue pride bereft, who act in perfect unity, whom you can order right and left with absolute impunity, who put their subjects at their ease by doing all they can to please, and thus, to earn their bread and cheese, seize every opportunity. Of happiness the very pith in Barataria you may see. A monarchy that's tempered with republican equality. A despotism strict combined with absolute equality. Gentlemen, we are much obliged to you for your expressions of satisfaction and good feeling. I say, we are much obliged to you for your expressions of satisfaction and good feeling. We heard you! We are delighted, at any time, to fall in with sentiments so charmingly expressed. That's all right! At the same time, there is just one little grievance that we should like to ventilate. What? Don't be alarmed. It's not serious. It is arranged that, until it is decided which of us two is the actual king, we are to act as one person. Exactly. Now, although we act as one person, we are, in point of fact, two persons. Uh, I don't think we can go into that. 
It is a legal fiction, and legal fictions are solemn things. Situated as we are, we can't recognize two independent responsibilities. No, but you can recognize two independent appetites. It's all very well to say we act as one person, but when you supply us with only one ration between us, I should describe it as a legal fiction carried a little too far. It's a rather nice point. I don't like to express an opinion offhand. Suppose we reserve it for argument before the full court. Yes, but what are we to do in the meantime? We, we want, want our, our tea. tea. I think we may make an interim order for double rations on their majesties, entering into the usual undertaking to indemnify in the event of an adverse decision. That, I think, will meet the case. But you must work hard. Stick to it. Nothing like work. Oh, certainly. We quite understand that a man who holds the magnificent position of king should do something to justify it. We are called Your Majesty. We are allowed to buy ourselves magnificent clothes. Our subjects frequently nod to us in the streets. The sentries always return our salutes. And we enjoy the inestimable privilege of heading the subscription list to all the principal charities. In return for these advantages, the least we can do is to make ourselves useful about the palace. Rising early in the morning, we proceed to light the fire. Then our majesty adorning, in its workaday attire, we embark without delay on the duties of the day. First, we polish off some batches of political dispatches and foreign politicians circumvent. Then, if business isn't heavy, we may hold a royal levy or ratify some acts of parliament. Then we proudly review the household troops with the usual shalu humps and shalu hoops, or receive with ceremonial and state an interesting eastern potentate. After that, we generally go and dress our private valet. It's a rather nervous duty. He's a touchy little man. Write some letters literary for our private secretary. He is shaky in his spelling, so we help him if we can. Then, in view of cravings inner, we go down and order dinner. Then we polish the regalia and the coronation plate. Spend an hour in titivating all our gentlemen in waiting, or we run on little errands for the ministers of state. Oh, the philosophers may sing of the troubles of a king, yet the duties are delightful and the privileges great. But the privilege and pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is to run on little errands for the ministers of state. Oh, philosophers may sing of the troubles of a king, Yet the duties are delightful, and the privilege is great. But the privilege and pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is to run on little errands for the ministers of state. After luncheon, making merry on a bun and glass of sherry, if we've nothing in particular to do, we may make a proclamation or receive a deputation. Then we possibly create a peer or two. Then we help a fellow creature on his path, with a garter, or the thistle, or the bath, or we dress and toddle off in semi-state, to a festival, a function, or a fete. Then we go and stand as sentry at the palace, private entry, marching hither, marching thither, up and down and to and fro, while the warrior on duty goes in search of beer and beauty, and it generally happens that he hasn't far to go. He relieves us, if he's able, just in time to lay the table. Then we dine and serve the coffee, and at half-past twelve or one, with a pleasure that's emphatic, we retire to our attic, with the gratifying feeling that our duty has been done. Oh, the philosophers may sing of the troubles of a king, but of pleasures there are many, and of worries there are none. And the culminating pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is the gratifying feeling that our duty has been done. Oh, philosophers may sing of the troubles of a king, yet the duties are delightful and the privilege is great. But the privilege and pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is to run on little errands for the ministers of state. Exeunt all but Marco and Giuseppe. Yes, it really is a very pleasant existence. They're all so singularly kind and considerate. 
You don't find them wanting to do this or wanting to do that or saying, it's my turn now. No, they let us have all the fun to ourselves and never seem to grudge it. It makes one feel quite selfish. It almost seems like taking advantage of their good nature. How nice they were about the double rations. Most considerate. Ah, there's only one thing wanting to make us thoroughly comfortable. And that is? The dear little wives we left behind us three months ago. Yes, it is dull without female society. We can do without everything else, but we can't do without that. And if we have that imperfection, we have everything. There is only one recipe for perfect happiness. Take a pair of sparkling eyes, hidden ever and anon, in a merciful eclipse. Do not heed their mild surprise, having passed the Rubicon. Take a pair of rosy lips. Take a figure trimly planned, such as admiration wets. Be particular in this. Take a tender little hand, fringed with dainty fingerettes. Press it in parenthesis. Ha ha! Take all these, you lucky man. Take and keep them if you can. Take a pretty little cot, quite a miniature affair, hung about with trellised vine. Furnish it upon the spot, with the treasures rich and rare I have endeavoured to define. Live to love, and love to live. You will ripen at your ease, growing on the sunny side. Fate has nothing more to give. You are a dainty man to please, if you are not satisfied. Ha ha! Take my counsel, happy man. Act upon it if you can. Enter Chorus of Contadine, running in, led by Fiametta and Vittoria. They are met by all the ex-gondoliers, who welcome them heartily. Here we are, at the risk of our lives, from ever so far, and we brought your wives. And to that end, we've crossed the main, and don't intend to return again. Though obedience is strong, curiosity is stronger. We waited for long, till we couldn't wait longer. It's imprudent, we know, but without your society, existence was slow, and we wanted variety. Existence was slow, and we wanted variety. So here we are, at the risk of our lives, ever so far, and we have brought your wives. And to that end, we've crossed the main, and don't intend to return again. Enter Ginetta and Tessa. They rush to the arms of Marco and Giuseppe. Tessa! Giuseppe! All embrace. Marco! Gianetta! After sailing to this island, tossing in a manner frightful, we are all once more on dry land. And we find the change delightful. As at home we've been remaining, we've not seen you both for ages. Tell me, are you fond of reigning? How's the food? And what's the wages? Does your new employment please ye? How does royalizing strike you? Is it difficult or easy? Do you think your subjects like you? I am anxious to elicit. Is it plain and easy steering? Take it all together. Is it better fun than gondoliering? We shall both go on requesting till you tell us. Never doubt it. Everything is interesting. Tell us. Tell us all about it. They will both go on requesting till you tell them, never doubt it. Everything is interesting. Tell us. Tell us all about it. Is the populace exacting? Do they keep you at a distance? All unaided are you acting? Or do they provide assistance? When you're busy, have you got to get up early in the morning? If you do what you ought not to, do they give the usual warning? With a horse do they equip you? Lots of trumpeting and drumming? Do the royal tradesmen tip you? Ain't the livery becoming? Does your human being inner feed on everything that nices? Do they give you wine for dinner? Peaches, sugar plums and ices? We shall both go on requesting till you tell us, never doubt it. Everything is interesting. Tell us. Tell us all about it. This is indeed a most delightful surprise. Yes, we thought you'd like it. You see, it was like this. After you left, we felt very dull and mopey. And the days crawled by. And you never wrote. So at last I said to Gianetta, I can't stand this any longer. Those two poor monarchs haven't got anyone to mend their stockings or sew on their buttons or patch their clothes. At least I hope they haven't. Let us all pack up a change and go see how they're getting on. And she said, done. And they all said, done. 
and we asked old Giacopo to lend us his boat, and he said, done. And we've crossed the sea, and thank goodness that's done, and here we are, and, and, I've done. And now, which of you is king? And which of us is queen? That we shan't know until nurse turns up. But never mind that. The question is, how shall we celebrate the commencement of our honeymoon? Gentlemen, will you allow us to offer you a magnificent banquet? We, we will. will. Thanks very much. And ladies, what do you say to a dance? A banquet and a dance? Oh, it's too much happiness. Dance a cachucha, fandango, bolero. Ceres, Voltrin, Manzanilla, Montero. Wine when it runs in abundance enhances the reckless delight of that wildest of dances. To the pretty pitter pitter patter and the glitter 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 clatter, glitter glitter clatter, pitter pitter patter, patter patter patter, patter will dance. All Ceres will drink, Manzanilla, Montero. For wine, when it runs in abundance, enhances the reckless delight of that wildest of dances. Cachuca. The dance is interrupted by the unexpected appearance of Don Alhambra, who looks on with astonishment. Marco and Giuseppe appear embarrassed. The others run off, except Drummer Boy, who is driven off by Don Alhambra. Good evening. Fancy ball? No, not exactly. A little friendly dance, that's all. Sorry you're late. But I saw a groom dancing. And a footman. Yes, that's the Lord High Footman. And, dear me, a common little drummer boy. Oh no, that's the Lord High Drummer Boy. But surely, surely the servants' hall is the place for these gentry? Oh dear, no. We have appropriated the servants' hall. It's the royal apartment, and accessible only by tickets obtainable at the Lord Chamberlain's office. We really must have some place that we can call our own. I'm afraid I'm not quite equal to the intellectual pressure of the conversation. You see, the monarchy has been remodelled on republican principles. What? All departments rank equally, and everybody is at the head of his department. I see. I'm afraid you're annoyed. No, I won't say that. It's not quite what I expected. I'm awfully sorry. So am I. By the by, can I offer you anything after your voyage? A plate of macaroni and a rusk. No, no, nothing, nothing. Obliged to be careful. Yes, gout. You see, in every court there are distinctions that must be observed. There are, are there? Why, of course. For instance, you wouldn't have a Lord High Chancellor played leapfrog with his own cook? Why not? Why not? Because a Lord High Chancellor is a personage of great dignity, who should never, under any circumstances, place himself in the position of being told to tuck in his tupney, except by a nobleman of his own rank. A Lord High Archbishop, for instance, might tell a Lord High Chancellor to tuck in his tupney, but certainly not a cook. Gentlemen, certainly not a cook. Not even a Lord High Cook? My good friend, that is a rank that is not recognised by the Lord Chamberlain's office. No, no, it won't do. I'll give you an instance in which the experiment was tried. There lived a king, as I've been told, in the wonder-working days of old, when hearts were twice as good as gold, and twenty times as mellow. Good temper triumphed in his face, and in his heart he found a place for all the erring human race, and every wretched fellow. When he had Rhenish wine to drink, 
it made him very sad to think that some at junket or at jink must be content with toddy with toddy must be content with toddy he wished all men as rich as he and he was rich as rich could be so to the top of every tree promoted everybody now that's the kind of king for me he wished all men as rich as he so to the top of every tree promoted everybody lord chancellors were cheap as sprats and bishops in their shovel hats were plentiful as tabby cats in point of fact too many ambassadors cropped up like hay prime ministers and such as they grew like asparagus in may and dukes were three a penny on every side field marshals gleamed small beer were lords lieutenant deemed with admirals the ocean teemed all round his wide dominions with admirals all round his wide dominions and party leaders you might meet in twos and threes in every street maintaining with no little heat their various opinions now that's a sight you couldn't beat two party leaders in each street maintaining with no little heat their various opinions that king although no one denies his heart was of abnormal size yet he'd have acted otherwise if he had been acuter the end is easily foretold when every blessed thing you hold is made of silver or of gold you long for simple pewter when you have nothing else to wear but cloth of gold and satins rare for cloth of gold you cease to care up goes the price of shoddy of shoddy up goes the price of shoddy in short whoever you may be to this conclusion you'll agree when everybody's somebody then no one's anybody now, now that's, that's as plain as plain, as plain can, can be. be to this conclusion, conclusion we, we agree. agree when everyone is somebody then no one's anybody Gianetta and Tessa enter unobserved. The two girls, impelled by curiosity, remain listening at the back of the stage. And now I have some important news to communicate. His Grace the Duke of Plaza Toro, Her Grace the Duchess, and their beautiful daughter, Casilda. I say their beautiful daughter, Casilda we heard you have arrived at barataria and may be here at any moment the duke and duchess are nothing to us but the daughter the beautiful daughter aha uh -huh. oh you're a lucky dog one of you i think you're a very incomprehensible old gentleman not a bit i'll explain many years ago when you whichever you are were a baby you whichever you are were married to a little girl who has grown up to be the most beautiful young lady in spain that beautiful young lady will be here to claim you whichever you are in half an hour and i congratulate that one whichever it is with all my heart married when a baby but we were married three months ago one of you only one the other whichever it is is an unintentional bigamist coming forward oh upon my word eh who are these young people who are we why their wives of course we've just arrived their wives oh dear this is very unfortunate oh dear this complicates matters dear dear what will her majesty say and do you mean to say that one of these monarchs was already married and that neither of us will be a queen that is the idea i intended to convey tessa and gianetta begin to cry tessa 
My dear, dear child. Get away. Perhaps it's you. My poor, poor little woman. Don't! Who knows whose husband you are? And pray, why didn't you tell us all about it before they left Venice? Because if I had, no earthly temptation would have induced these gentlemen to leave two such extremely fascinating and utterly irresistible little ladies. <sighs> There's something in that. I may mention that you will not be kept long in suspense, as the old lady who nursed the royal child is at present in the torture chamber waiting for me to interview her. Poor old girl. Hadn't you better go and put her out of her suspense? Oh, no. There's no hurry. She'll be all right. She has all the illustrated papers. However, I'll go and interrogate her, and in the meantime... May I suggest the absolute propriety of your regarding yourself as single young ladies? Good evening. Exit on Alhambra. Well, here's a pleasant state of things. Delightful. One of us is married to two young ladies and nobody knows which, and the other is married to one young lady whom nobody can identify. And one of us is married to one of you. And the other is married to nobody. But which of you is married to which of us? And what's to become of the other? About to cry. It's quite simple. Observe. Two husbands have managed to acquire three wives. Three wives, two husbands. That's two-thirds of a husband to each wife. Oh, Mount Vesuvius, here we are in arithmetic. My good sir. One can't marry a vulgar fraction. You've no right to call me a vulgar fraction. We are getting rather mixed. The situation is entangled. Let's try and comb it out. In a contemplative fashion and a tranquil frame of mind, free from every kind of passion, some solution let us find. Let us grasp the situation, solve the complicated plot. Quiet, calm deliberation disentangles every knot. I no doubt Giuseppe wedded. That's of course a slice of luck. He is rather dunderheaded. Still, distinctly, he's a duck. In a contemplative fashion, and a tranquil frame of mind, free from every kind of passion, some solution let us find. I, a victim too of Cupid, Marco married, that is clear. He's particularly stupid, still distinctly he's a dear. Let us grasp the situation. Solve the complicated plot. Quiet, calm deliberation. Disentangles every knot. To Gianetta I was mated. I can prove it in a trice. Though her charms are overrated, still I own she's rather nice. In a contemplative fashion. And a tranquil frame of mind. Free from every kind of passion. Some solution let us find. I to Tessa, willy-nilly, all at once a victim fell. She is what is called a silly. Still, she answers pretty well. Let us grasp the situation, solve the complicated plot. Quiet, calm deliberation disentangles every knot. Now, when we were pretty babies, someone married us, that's clear. And if I can catch her, I'll pinch her and scratch her and send her away with a flea in her ear. He whom that young lady married to receive her can't refuse. If I overtake her... I'll warrant I'll make her to shake in her aristocratical shoes. To Tessa. Married your Giuseppe, you and he will have to part. To Gianetta. If I have to do it, I'll warrant she'll rue it. I'll teach her to marry the man of my heart. To Gianetta. If she married Messa Marco, you're a spinster, that is plain. To Tessa. No matter, no matter. If I can get at her, I doubt if her mother will know her again. Quiet, Quiet, calm, calm deliberation, deliberation disentangles, disentangles every knot. Exeunt, pondering. March, enter procession of retainers, heralding approach of Duke, Duchess, and Casilda. All three are now dressed with the utmost magnificence. With ducal pomp and ducal pride, announce these comers, O ye kettle drummers, comes Baratarius' high-born bride. Ye sounding cymbals clang, 
She comes to claim the royal hand, Proclaim their graces, O oh, ye double bases, Of the king who rules this goodly land, Ye brazen brasses bang. This polite attention touches Heart of duke and heart of duchess, who resigned their pet with profound regret. She was beauty of a model. When a tiny tiddle toddle, and, and at twenty one, she's, she's excelled, excelled by, by none. none. With ducal pomp and ducal pride, announce these comers, O oh, ye kettle drummers, comes Barataria's high born bride. Ye sounding cymbals clang. She comes to claim the royal hand, Proclaim their graces, O oh, ye double bases, Of the king who rules this goodly land, Ye brazen brasses bang. To his attendants. Be good enough to inform his majesty That his grace, the Duke of Plazzatoro, Limited, has arrived, and begs, Desires, demands, And demands an audience. Exuant attendants. And now, my child, prepare to receive the husband to whom you were united under such interesting and romantic circumstances. But which is it? There are two of them. It is true that at present his majesty is a double gentleman. But as soon as the circumstances of his marriage are ascertained, he will, ipso facto, boil down to a single gentleman, thus presenting a unique example of an individual who becomes a single man and a married man by the same operation. I have known instances in which the characteristics of both conditions existed concurrently in the same individual. Ah, he couldn't have been a Plazzatoro. Oh, couldn't he, though? Well, whatever happens, I shall, of course, be a dutiful wife. But I can never love my husband. I don't know. It's extraordinary what unprepossessing people one can love if one gives one's mind to it. I loved your father. My love? That remark is a little hard, I think. Rather cruel, perhaps? Somewhat uncalled for, I venture to believe? It was very difficult, my dear, but I said to myself, that man is a duke and I will love him. Several of my relations bet me I couldn't, but I did, desperately. On the day when I was wedded to your admirable sire, I acknowledged that I dreaded an explosion of his ire. I was overcome with panic, for his temper was volcanic, and I didn't dare revolt, for I feared a thunderbolt. I was always very wary, for his fury was ecstatic. His refined vocabulary most unpleasantly emphatic. To the thunder of this tartar I knocked under like a martyr. When intently he was fuming, I was gently unassuming. When reviling me completely, I was smiling very sweetly. Giving him the very best and getting back the very worst. That is how I tried to tame your great progenitor at first, but I found that a reliance on my threatening appearance and a resolute defiance of marital interference and a gentle intimation of my firm determination to see what I could do to be wife and husband too was the only thing required for to make his temper supple and you couldn't have desired a more reciprocating couple. Ever willing to be wooing, we were billing, we were cooing. When I merely from him parted, we were nearly broken-hearted. When in sequel reunited, we were equally delighted. So with double-shotted guns and collars nailed unto the mast, I tamed your insignificant progenitor, at last. My only hope is that when my husband sees what a shady family he has married into, he will repudiate the contract altogether. Shady? A nobleman shady, who is blazing in the luster of unaccustomed pocket money? A nobleman shady, who can look back upon ninety-five quarterings? 
It is not every nobleman who is ninety-five quarters in arrear. I mean, who can look back upon ninety-five of them. And this, just as I have been floated at a premium. Oh, fie! Your Majesty is surely unaware that directly your Majesty's father came before the public, he was applied for over and over again. My dear, her Majesty's father was in the habit of being applied for over and over again, and very urgently applied for, too, long before he was registered under the Limited Liability Act. To help unhappy commoners and add to their enjoyment, affords a man of noble rank congenial employment. Of our attempts we offer you examples illustrative. The work is light, and, I may add, it's most remunerative. Small titles and orders for mayors and recorders I get, and they're highly delighted. They're highly delighted. MPs baroneted, sham colonels gazetted and second-rate aldermen knighted. Yes, aldermen knighted. Foundation stone laying. I find very paying. It adds a large sum to my makings. Large sums to his makings. At charity dinners, the best of speech spinners. I get ten percent on the takings. One-tenth of the takings. I present any lady whose conduct is shady or smacking of doubtful propriety. Doubtful propriety. When virtue would quash her, I take and whitewash her, and launch her in first-rate society. First-rate society. I recommend acres of clumsy dressmakers, their fit and their finishing touches. Their finishing touches. A sum, in addition, they pay for permission to say that they make for the duchess. They make for the duchess. Those pressing prevailers... Those ready-made tailors quote me as their great double barrel. Their great double barrel. I allow them to do so. So Robinson wearing Crusoe apparel. would jibe at their wearing apparel. I sit by selection upon the direction of several companies' bubble. All companies' bubble. As soon as they're floated, I'm freely banknoted. I'm pretty well paid for my trouble. He's paid for his trouble. At middle-class party, I play at Ecarty, and I'm by no means a beginner. She's not a beginner. To one of my station, the remuneration, five guineas a night, and my dinner. And wine with her dinner. I write letters blatant on medicines patent, and use any other you mustn't. Believe me, you mustn't. And vow my complexion derives its perfection. From somebody's soap, which it doesn't. It certainly doesn't. We're ready as witness to anyone's fitness to fill any place or preferment. A place or preferment. We enjoy an interment. We're often in waiting. The spark of a swindle. And sometimes attend an interment. In short, if you'd kindle the spark of a swindle. Lure simpletons into your clutches. Yes, into your clutches. Or hoodwink a debtor, you cannot do better. Or hoodwink a debtor, you cannot do better. Than trot out a duke or a duchess. A duke or a duchess. Enter Marco and Giuseppe. Ah, their majesties. Your majesty. Bows with great ceremony. The Duke of Plazatoro, I believe. The same. Marco and Giuseppe offer to shake hands with him. The Duke bows ceremoniously. They endeavor to imitate him. Allow me to present... The young lady when I was married. Marco and Giuseppe offer to shake hands with her. Casilda curtsies formally. They endeavor to imitate her. Gentlemen, I am the most obedient servant of... One of you. Oh, Louis. I am now about to address myself... To the gentleman whom my daughter married. The other may allow his attention to wander if he likes, for what I am about to say does not concern him. Sir, you will find in this young lady a combination of excellences which you would search for in vain in any young lady who had not the good fortune to be my daughter. There is some little doubt 
as to which of you is the gentleman I am addressing, and which is the gentleman who is allowing his attention to wander. But when that doubt is solved, I shall say, still addressing the attentive gentleman, take her, and may she make you happier than her mother has made me. Sir? If possible. And now there is a little matter to which I think I am entitled to take exception. I come here in state with Her Grace the Duchess, and Her Majesty my daughter. And what do I find? Do I find, for instance, a guard of honor to receive me? No. No. The town illuminated? No. No. Refreshment provided? No. No. A royal salute fired? No. 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 Triumphal arches erected? No. 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 The bell set ringing? No. no. Yes, one, the visitors, and I rang it myself. It is not enough. It is not enough. Upon my honor, I'm very sorry, but you see, I was brought up in a gondola, and my ideas of politeness are confined to taking off my cap to my passengers when they tip me. That's all very well in its way, but it is not enough. I'll take off anything else in reason. But a royal salute to my daughter. It costs so little. Papa, I don't want a salute. My dear sir, as soon as we know which of us is entitled to take that liberty, she shall have as many salutes as she likes. As for guards of honor and triumphal arches, you don't know our people. They wouldn't stand it. They are very off-hand with us. Very off-hand indeed. Oh, but you mustn't allow that. You must keep them in proper discipline. You must impress your court with your importance. You want deportment, carriage. We've got a carriage. Manner, dignity. There must be a good deal of this sort of thing, business, and a little of this sort of thing, business, and possibly just a soup con of this sort of thing, business, and so on. Oh, it's very useful and most effective. Just attend to me. You are a king. I am a subject. Very good. I am a courtier, grave and serious, who is about to kiss your hand. Try to combine a pose imperious with a demeanor nobly bland. Let us combine a pose imperious with a demeanor nobly bland. Marco and Giuseppe endeavor to carry out his instructions. That's, if anything, too unbending, too aggressively stiff and grand. They suddenly modify their attitudes. Now to the other extreme you're tending. Don't be so deucedly condescending. Now to the other extreme you're tending. Don't be so dreadfully condescending. Oh, hard to please some noblemen seem. At first, if anything, too unbending. Off we go to the other extreme. Too confoundedly condescending. Now a gavotte performs sedately. Off your hand with conscious pride. Take an attitude not too stately, still sufficiently dignified. Oncely, twicely, oncely, twicely. Bow impressively ere you glide. They do so. Now for an attitude not too stately, still sufficiently dignified. They endeavor to carry out his instructions. Beating time. Capital both, capital both. You've caught it nicely. That is the style of thing precisely. Capital both, capital both. That is the style of the thing precisely. Oh, sweet to earn a nobleman's praise. Capital both, capital, capital both. both. We've caught it nicely. Supposing he's right in what he says, this is the style of thing precisely. Gavote. At the end, exeunt Duke and Duchess, leaving Casilda with Marco and Giuseppe. To Marco. The old birds have gone away and left the young chickens together. That's called tact. It's very awkward. We really ought to tell her how we are situated. It's not fair to the girl. Then why don't you do it? I'd rather not. You. I don't know how to begin. To Casilda. Uh, madam, 
I, we, that is, several of us. Gentlemen, I am bound to listen to you, but it is right to tell you that, not knowing I was married in infancy, I am over head and ears in love with somebody else. Our case exactly. We are over head and ears in love with somebody else. Enter Gianetta and Tessa. In point of fact, with our wives. Your wives? Then you are married? It's not our fault. We knew nothing about it. We are sisters in misfortune. We are sisters in misfortune. My good girls, I don't blame you. Only, before we go any further, we must really arrive at some satisfactory arrangement, or we shall get hopelessly complicated. Here is a case unprecedented. Here are a king and queen ill-starred. Ever since marriage was first invented... It never was known a case so hard. I may be said to have been bisected... By a profound catastrophe. Through a calamity unexpected... I am divisible into three. O oh, moralists all! How can you call marriage a state of unity? When excellent husbands are bisected... And wives divisible into three. O oh, moralists all! How can you call marriage a state of union true? One third of myself is married to half of ye or you. When half of myself has married one third of ye or you. Enter Don Alhambra, followed by Duke, Duchess, and all the chorus. Now let the loyal lieges gather round. The prince's foster mother has been found. She will declare to silver clarion's sound the rightful king let him forthwith be crowned don alhambra brings forward inez the prince's foster mother speak woman speak we're all attention the news we seek this moment mention to us they bring his foster mother or this my brother the royal prince was by the king entrusted to my fond care ere i grew old and crusted when traitors came to steal his son reputed my own small boy i deftly substituted the villains fell into the trap completely i hid the prince away still sleeping sweetly i called him son with pardonable slyness his name louise behold his royal highness sensation louise ascends the throne crowned and robed as king rushing to his arms louis casilda embrace is this indeed the king oh wondrous revelation oh unexpected thing unlooked for situation this statement we receive with sentiments conflicting our hearts rejoice and grieve each other contradicting to those whom we adore we can be reunited on one point rather sore but on the whole delighted when others claimed thy dainty hand i waited 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 as prudence so i understand dictated tated tated by virtue of our early vow recorded corded corded your pure and patient love is now rewarded warded warded then hail o king of a golden land and the high-born bride who claims his hand the past is dead and you gain your own a royal crown and a golden throne all kneel louise crowns casilda once more gondolieri both skilful and wary free from this quandary contented are we ah from royalty flying our gondolas plying and merrily crying our prim Stally, ah, so goodbye, Cachuca, Fandango, Bolero. We'll dance a farewell to that measure. Old Ceres, adieu, Massanilla, Montero. We leave you with feelings of pleasure. Curtain. End of Act Two. End of the Gondoliers by W. S. Gilbert.